Fantastic, thank you so much, Ross. And I'm going to, uh, Leila, there, if there's an echo, it may be that um, you need to do the tools of audio setup wizard. And, and Ross, if you could just help people um, in the chat, you know, doing some, just help, helping people out, that would be great. And welcome, Celine, good to see you. Um, so I just want to, um, say hello and introduce myself first, and then I'm going to pass the microphone to Ross and ask him to, and then we are going to get going. So my name is John Cropper, and I'm the Director of uh, Project Services for Lingos, and I'll talk a little bit about what Lingos is in, in a moment. Um, and I've been working in and around projects and NGOs for, you know, well over 20 years, and I was one of the original group that actually wrote the PMD Pro certification and now I'm responsible for all of the uh, capacity building work that Lingos does around uh, um, project management and around um, PMD Pro. Uh, before working for Lingos, I worked for Oxfam GB. I uh, did lots of jobs. One of them I was responsible for the project management systems. I was also the programs director in Latin America, and I ran a global program on gender and governance. So that's just a little bit about me. And Ross, uh, over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Ross Coxon. I am the senior facilitator at Lingos, and I spend large swathes of my time training PMD Pro. Uh, both virtually uh, in this style and face-to-face. -face. I train uh, PMD Pro 1 and 2 and do the train the trainer. Um, and I've trained some of your organizations and not all of them. Uh, I've been involved with PMD Pro a little later than John. Um, I didn't write any of the guide or the exam, but uh, I was uh, very keen and, and an early adopter a long time ago. Um, uh, when I was working for other NGOs other than Lingos. And uh, then I've moved to Lingos to work full-time on PMD Pro with Project Services. Uh, back over to you, John. Thank you so much, Ross. And uh, Megan, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you for coming into the session. We've, we're just getting started. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through, it's like doing a little bit of the, an overview, as it says, on the screen of the uh, um, the PMD Pro tools and phases and processes, but we're also going to um, to give you a chance to say, well, in, as we go through each one, if if one of these looks more interesting to you, we'll give you a chance to vote uh, and then um, choose one. Then we can we can look uh, at that at the tool or whatever it is in more detail. Uh, as well. Okay, so let's move on. And I really like these two quotes. I mean, and, and for me, um, I, I think that it, it really um, helps to summarize what we're trying to do here. And I think it, it, it's really important for NGO projects because um, when, when you look at many of the existing project management guidelines from the private sector, PRINCE2 or PMP or IPMA, they're all, they're very good. I mean, I did PRINCE2 so long ago that the online options didn't exist. You still had to write um, essays. They're very good. But there is an assumption in them about, well, why you're doing the project. And actually, for NGOs, it is really important, you know, you've got to do the right project, and you've also got to do it in the right way. And I think methodologies like PRIS2 or PMP are, are very good at doing things the right way, but they're much less good at identifying the right project to do, which, which is, you know, the, the link with how NGOs do projects. Um, doing the wrong project well not only will not help, it might actually make things worse. So 
we've got to do both. And welcome, Virginia. Good to see you. Thank you for, for joining. We're just getting started. So we've got to do both. We've got to do the right project in the right way. And that's what we're going to be talking at today, and, and just how some of the tools in PMD Pro can help. Um, and before we do that, a, a very quick, just a, a mention of what Lingos is. Lingos stands for Learning in NGOs. And we're a membership organization. We've got around about 85 members now. So some of your organizations are, are already members, which is great. And uh, Alizy, welcome. Thank you for coming in. We, we're, just getting, we're just getting started, OK? So Lingos is a membership organization about 85 members, um, and we help, um, we help members on a range of things, uh, a lot of e-learning uh, and things around e-learning, but it was the members who asked Lingos to do something about project management. Welcome, Mildred. Good to see you. And, uh, and that was my involvement with Lingos, started in 2007, when the, some of the members said, please do something about project management. A working group was set up. There were 10 of us. I was representing Oxfam. Welcome, Mark. Good to see you. Welcome, Sarah. And um, we put together, under Lingus' leadership, what is now a PMD Pro. And, and where are we now? Um, well, more than 10,000 people have been certified. Um, PMD Pro exams have begun in over 70 countries. It's in a whole range of languages. It's in uh, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese. And as of very, very recently, the exam is also now available in Arabic, Dari, and Russian. And, you know, and hopefully more languages, I, I am hopeful, the World Vision are going to put it into Bangla. So, so it's fantastic. And, and, and you can see some of the organizations that have been engaging on the screen. And one of the things, yeah, there, are, there are many different ways to engage. You know, some people are training lots of their staff. Uh, other people are, are training, you know, they're training organizations. So it doesn't really matter. And, and what, what PMD Pro is trying to do, hello, Marcus, welcome. Uh, we're just getting started. All, all PMD Pro is is trying to find a way um, to, to give NGO staff access in a way that is simple, and easy and contextualized to the, the tools and the, the techniques of project management. Um, and and I, I really, I do think it's, it's important because um, very often I've, I've seen so many projects where either the idea was not, people weren't able to implement it, or the idea was um, maybe came from somewhere completely different. And then people struggle with, well, how, how do I make this project work? Maybe the, the design process was flawed. Maybe the, 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 the ideas and the design were very good, but people hadn't been given access to the, the tools to help them. I, I remember actually seeing one, one time some colleagues who were really struggling um, with time management, and we went over some some simple time management techniques, and they were really, really good. They were bright. They got it immediately. Just nobody had shown them these techniques before. Um, and one thing that I feel, and this is something uh, I, I think that Ross has expressed really well, is that NGO project managers are very good, but a lot of the time they're, they're doing everything in their heads because nobody has given them the tools. So that's all that PMD Pro is trying to do. So we know that project ideas come from many uh, possible places. Um, so they might come from beneficiaries themselves. They might come from partners, from local partner organizations, implementing organizations, whoever that is. Um, Sometimes, though, I've seen projects which come from fundraisers. And then that idea descends on the team in the field. What do I do? 
This is not relevant, it's not appropriate, it's not doable. Sometimes donors will say, we want you to do a project about this. Okay. Um, sometimes it can be somebody senior in the organization. Somebody saying, I want you to do a project about this. Or, I was just visiting that country and they had a really good project about this. You should do something. Now, whether that's the right project to, to do or not is another question. But these ideas can come from a lot of, a lot of different places. And, and Ross has put a good question in the chat. Where do your project ideas come from? It would just be really interesting to, to know. So do feel free at any time to put your ideas, comments, questions in the chat. And, uh, and we are really happy to help with any, with any aspect of it. So if something is not clear, please write in the chat. And this is one of the reasons that we have a couple of facilitators because it means that uh, one of us can keep an eye on the chat as well, so that if there are questions and that we're not dealing with it, then we can stop, go back to it, to make sure that people's questions are answered. And this picture um, is um, a, a, a just a re an interesting, I think, reminder that just because we have an idea from somewhere, it doesn't make it a good one. This was from an initiative a few years ago um, to provide uh, pumps for wells that were going to be uh, powered by children's um, play roundabouts. And, you know, pretty much every evaluation said that this is, you know, it was a good, a good nice idea on paper. But it didn't work at all in practice. And it actually, in many cases, made things worse as existing hand pumps were taken away and replaced by these, but the hand pumps were better. Um, so the ideas for projects can come from many different sources. Good, not so good, bad. But in every case, we have to find a way to translate that idea into something that is uh, that can be implemented, and if the idea is not good, hopefully it can be modified enough to make it good, or if the idea is really poor, stopped before we invest um, too much uh, time, effort, or resource um, in that idea. And so to help us, we've got the PMD Pro model, which you can see on the screen, and there are six phases, and I'm going to go over this uh, fairly quickly, and then we're going to go into each phase in more detail and start looking at some of the, the tools, the ideas, the, uh, the techniques in, in each one. And then after each one, you're going to have an opportunity to say, actually, I'd like to learn some more about this, uh, uh, and then we can do that. And it'll also be interesting to help us design future webinars because you know, the more feedback we get about um, what people are most interested in, well, the better, really. So the, the beginning is project identification and design. And this is very much where um, PMD Pro tries to build on the good work that NGOs already do. I mean, and NGOs are very good at uh, identifying projects and working out how to do it what is going to have the most impact on beneficiaries, communities, etc., etc. And this is an area that is almost completely missing from generic project management methodologies like PRINCE2 or, 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 or PMP. Then what, so we, now we know what we want to do. We have a, 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 we have a logic for our in intervention, but we have to start making sure that we do it in the right way. So this is very much about the right project. And this is about starting to try and make sure that we do the project in the right way. And it's called project setup because we're trying to 
create the conditions for the project to be successful. And, and, and maybe, you know, if the idea is not so good, we need to go back, modify it, and maybe stop it before we start planning, implementing, etc. And you see these little triangles on the screen, and these are decision gates. And again, this is a very flexible tool that you, you can have between phases or in the middle of a phase, you decide. But the idea is a moment in time where you can stop and take a look at the project. How are we doing? Are we on time, on scope, on budget? Yes, no, why, why not? And I think the really important question is, do we need to, uh, um, do we need to stop the project? Or um, do we need to make some sort of modification? And if we do, the earlier we make that modification, the more effective it is likely to be. So once we've created the conditions for the project to be a success, we need to do some detailed planning. And I think this is very much at the heart of good um, project management. And if you, if you don't have a good plan, well, the project is going to be very difficult. As there are some sayings about this. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Or, you know, if you don't know where you want to go, every way is right. And, and it, it, it's easy to talk like that. But in planning, we've got some very uh, simple tools to help people construct accurate, realistic, comprehensive, and detailed plans. And with that, hopefully, implementation is easier. Um, now, implementation is probably 80 or 90 percent of the project, but there is a clear iteration between planning and implementation. I mean, when you work, some things go well, some things go better than expected, and some things don't. Well, you can't just ignore what, what's not going well or what's going wrong. You have to stop, think, modify, do something about it. Maybe you need to plan again. And then you continue implementing. So that's why we have this cycle to show the iteration between planning and implementation. And you can have decision gates um, at different stages, I would suggest um, a good place to have a decision gate is at the end of each quarter, or maybe each six months. Your moment of control. Stop, look, consult. How's the project doing? Are we on time, on scope, on budget? Do we need to make changes? Again, I've never seen a project that didn't need any changes. So if we know the change is going to be needed. It's very much a question of how we manage that. So we are in control of the change, and the changes are not in control of us. And, and very much, um, that is what monitoring and evaluation and control are all about. Now, again, monitoring and evaluation, NGOs do good work here. There are some fantastic monitoring and evaluation mechanisms, frameworks, tools. But when we created PND Pro, we also wanted to very specifically add in the word control because, and I know it's not a very NGO friendly word. You know, NGOs, it's all about participation and, and yeah, that's great. But a lot of project management is also about control, making sure that our projects come in on or under budget, that we achieve our scope. And we achieve it within the time frame that we have set. And at the end of the project, we've got the transition phase. And again, a little bit different. Many private sector projects finish. That's it. Done. Our sector, it's a bit more complicated. Maybe we are handing over to somebody else, a, 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 a local partner, maybe a government agency. Um, maybe we are expanding the project in some way. So again, there are some. Uh, I, th I think there's some added complexity uh, there as well. So this is the uh, overall 
model of PMD Pro, um, and you'll notice that one big difference from many NGO project models is that it is linear. And many NGO models are, have lots of circles in them. And what we wanted to emphasize is that a project should have a clear start and a clear end. And normally, when the end just gets extended, uh, and extended again, and extended again, that's usually a sign of a problem somewhere. So project is a clear start and a clear, uh, a clear end. And absolutely, as Ross is saying, please, any questions, any time. I mean, what I always like to say is, the only silly question is the question you, you don't ask. Okay, so let's go into this in a bit more detail. So project identification and design, the first phase. And I imagine that many of the things that you see here are going to be familiar. We've got tools like log frames. Um, objective trees, problem trees, triangulation. And that's because, as I, as I said a moment ago, NGOs do some fantastic work here. Um, very good frameworks about how to identify and design projects. And with PMD Pro, we didn't want to replicate it. We didn't want there to be another one. This is just a, a, a summary. And what we want to do is ground the tools of project management in the good practice that the sector all already has. So as we, um, as we go through identification and design, there are some things that we need to do. You know, we need to understand the needs. So, um, so uh, Bradshaw developed four categories of needs. It's a way of describing what we're actually talking about. It's easy to say, this is a need. Okay, whose need? My need, your need? Is it the community's need? Who is speaking in the community? Is it them directly? Is it somebody speaking on behalf of the community? Is it an expert? Who is the expert? Has somebody observed something? You know, what, what exactly do we need? And something that we've got that can be very helpful is the idea of triangulation. If I go to a community and I see that, well, actually, you know, maybe the mothers and the families are all complaining that it's really dirty. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of fecal waste everywhere. The water's polluted and children are getting sick. Okay, that's one need. And then, actually, um, a, a doctor from a nearby health centre says that, you know, this village has got much worse sanitation than the other villages. And compared with the health figures in those villages, this one is much worse. Well, now I've got, I've got two people saying something similar. And if I then observe that actually, you know, the community, wherever there are latrines available, people are using them, now I've got more data sources giving me a, a, a better picture. Okay, now I have a better understanding of what the needs are. So we're trying to get two or more um, different points of or different perspectives to coincide. And there are many, many, many tools that we've got that, that can help us collect data. Some of these are secondary, which are great because they are already there. But you also have uh, primary data collection tools, which can be quantitative, it's about numbers, or qualitative as well. Um, and stakeholder management, well, who are our stakeholders? Well, actually, an NGO stakeholder map can be really quite complex, and we need to understand the power and the influence that different stakeholders have. And that's what, where Venn diagrams can be very helpful. They give us a, a quick uh, visual graphic map of, okay, these are the stakeholders, this is the relationship between them, How much power do stakeholders have? And clearly, this is subjective, because um, if you look at the situation from different points of view, then power will appear differently. So Venn diagrams can 
help us with this. And all of this information can give us a, I think, a better understanding of what the problems really are. And then the problem tree is an opportunity to really explore this. Because you've got to make sure that you're dealing with the roots of the problem, not the symptoms. And many projects go wrong because they're actually not really dealing with the causes of the problems. And what causes the causes of the problems? So that's what the problem tree tool is all about. And the objective tree is almost a mirror image. The objective tree is, well, we take our problem and we turn our problem into something positive. So, for example, in, if we say, if our problem was talking about uh, children not being healthy, water being polluted, maybe we'd say, you know, the water is, the water is polluted. But the objective tree would say something like, well, you know, the water is clean. So it's almost a mirror image. And we're trying to say, well, if we want that water to be clean, what do we need to do? What could we do? And um, this is so we're now starting to go from a problem to some ideas of what might our interventions be. And scope management is going to help us choose what we do and what we don't do. Because maybe we don't have enough money to do all of it. Maybe we don't have enough skills. So um, that's where the scope management can help us. And the triple constraint is, I think, a very interesting idea that's helping us look at time, cost, and scope. I'm just putting that in the chat. And the idea is that as we plan our project and manage it, time, cost, and scope needs to be balanced. If I come to you and say, you know we agreed that project, I'm going to cut your budget by 20%. Well, there will be an impact on the time and or the scope. So the idea of the triple constraint is that there is a relationship between the three points of the triangle, time, cost, and scope. And we need to make sure that that triangle stays balanced. So a change in any one of these will have an effect on the others. Um, and I can see, yeah, Ross is drawing the triangle on the screen, which is great. And when we've done all of this, then um, the lock frame is a tool that can help us um, to reflect what we want to do and show us the logical uh, linkages between um, the activities that we want to do, the outputs, the outcomes, and uh, the <coughs> excuse me and the actual impact. There are different tools. You have um, results frameworks as well. A theory of change is more and more popular now. I think theory of change works much better at the program level. Um, log frames, results frameworks can be used at, at either. But again, and, and sometimes you know, people are really uh, are very against log frames. It's really difficult. It's complex. And what I've usually found when I explore this is that it's not that the tool is difficult. It's that people haven't done the analysis, so they're not actually clear about what are the input activities, output outcomes, and, and, and the goal. And if you don't know what you want to do, then it's very difficult to write it down. So what we're trying to do here is to make sure that we are doing the right project. And then the, and then the next phase is going to be, um, <coughs> excuse me, the next phase is going to be the project setup phase. So, oh, sorry, excuse me just one moment. Uh, here we go to the project setup phase. So, and what would, uh, welcome Lillian, good to see you. Thank you for coming into the room. And so now we know what we want to do. We know we're doing the right project, so we've got to do it in the right way, you know, we hope. And we've got, we've got a number of things to look at. 
we've got to make sure that we've got the skills to do the work. So you've got a little picture there of a spider diagram, a very simple tool to allow us to assess the capacity of the stuff. If you and or your partners do not have the skills, you will have a problem. We have to make sure that risk is being managed. And here you can see a little mouse that clearly has done the PMD Pro certification. But we've got to make sure we understand what, what, what the risks are before we move forward. Who is going to take the big decisions about the project? Well, what's the governance structure going to be? How do we get these different perspectives together? There might be uh, um, and different ways of doing that, but we need to know what they are before we start, not try to work it out halfway through. And uh, here we've got decision gates. There's a little, uh, a little typo there. I'm just going to... Uh, cross that out and put in a G. Um, decision gates are a, I'm going to put there we go, then we've got a little G. Um, decision gates are a way that we can say, well, I'll, you know, <laughs> I say, yes, Ross, it's a, a risk mitigation mouse. Absolutely. So the decision gates are a series of moments, and we already talked a little bit about decision gates uh, you know, when we did the overview of the model. But we get our wonderful idea from a project. Well, does everybody agree? Does your boss agree? Does the country director or the regional director, whoever it is, do they agree? Does the organization support you? Well, if not, you'd probably better not continue. Well, if, okay, in turn, many people agree it's a good idea. Okay. Is funding available? Do we think we can get some funding for this? Now, that's a bit more difficult. Maybe there are reasons to go forward, even if funding is difficult. But maybe you say, actually, we'd better stop. If you think you can get funding, you can then do a funding proposal. And finally, at the end of it, so now you've got a proposal, everybody loves it, donors agree, you've got your money. Well, you know, the idea is to have a final internal check to make sure, yeah, we are everybody, we are all on the same page, we all agree with the project, we've got the same idea. And a really interesting tool to help us with that is the Project Charter. A simple, short, high-level document that can say, this is the scope, this is what we're trying to do, everybody agrees it, and it also can discuss things like governance, maybe some of the big risks, maybe some of the decision gates as well, so that your key stakeholders all share the same idea about what you're going to be doing. And then if you need to make a change in the project, fine, you change the charter. And because it's a short document, I, my own experience is it makes it much more likely that people read it, whereas proposals tend to be very long and very boring. And once they've been written, they never get looked at again until the final evaluation or a midterm evaluation. Uh, hardly anybody reads the contract, which is uh, uh, wrong in, in my view. But a project charter should be a really simple, high-level document. And there are some different names for it. It could be a project summary document. You know, the name, frankly, doesn't really matter. It, it's what it's trying to do. And the idea is that the charter is kept live. You keep updating it to make sure that it continues to be useful. OK, so that's an overview of, of um, the setup phase. So. Um, this is an opportunity to do some voting. Actually, let's let's ha let's let's try and let, let's have a uh, have a look at this. Um, and if you look on your screens above the list of people, you can see um, a, a button where there's a little A. And if you click on that, you, it, you see it's A, B, C, or D. And if you'd like to learn more about risk management or governance or decision gates or skills, this is an opportunity. And we can talk about that in a little bit 
um, more detail. So this is your chance to vote, and so that we can try to make sure that we are we are meeting uh, your needs. So just go ahead and vote, and we'll give you a moment to do that. Thank you, Ross. Ross is showing everybody just where the button where the button is. And as I said, apart from you know helping us right now, um, it's, it, it helps us in the future because you know, if we know what people are really interested in, well, you know, we, we, can, we can focus on that in the future. Uh, and I can see people are voting, so thank you. You all get a big round of applause. Well done. And I think this is. I think Ross, it's time to distribute. Uh, um, some, some virtual cake as well. We haven't we haven't distributed any virtual cake yet, so there you go. Yeah, it looks like being a close call between uh, 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 um, skills mapping and risk management. Well, uh, um, oh, uh, and Decision Gates is is making a is is making a late entry. Uh, um, so at the moment, it looks like um, four and four. Um, let's. Have a look at Ross. I don't know if you're seeing um, if everybody has voted. Are we waiting for anybody? Um, yeah, Julia hasn't voted, and Megan hasn't voted, and neither Sarah. But perhaps uh, most people have voted now. I'll put the results on the screen for you. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's four. It was four, four. <laughs> So it's still a draw. Okay, well, look, what we can do, let's look at skills mapping now. The reason for that is not that, for heaven, heaven forbid, the risk management is not important, but we have another webinar coming up on risk management just by itself. So we'll certainly be covering, covering that in the webinar series. Um, and decision gates, I mean, that's interesting. We could certainly put together a, uh, um, a webinar on the control framework and how decision gates. Um, thanks. So uh, maybe let's let's go to skills mapping. And I mean, Ross, this might be a, an interesting one for you to to cover because I know this is something that you've thought about a lot, and you've 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 also you know been involved in in a, in a number of different roles and times. So Ross, why don't you tell us a little bit more about skills mapping? Over. Thanks, John. Uh, hi, everybody. I think the, the beauty of this tool is its simplicity. Um, it's not a simplistic tool, uh, but it is, it, is, it is simple to use. Um, you identify uh, the key areas of skill sets that you need to operate in any given project. Um, so, so in this example, this is a, a PMD Pro uh, skills map, but you know, if you were running uh, an education and uh, an improved teacher training uh, program, or you were running even a campaign, perhaps something for WWF might run uh, a, a campaign, an advocacy campaign. You know, we're going to write the kind of skills we need for a project. Now, there are many and varied, but what you really need to do is is sort of distill it down to the core critical success factor skills. Once you've got those, let's say six, eight, ten, something like that, then it's about sitting down with your team, or if you work with implementing partners, perhaps you're implementing um, your implementing partner, and scoring yourself in an honest and open way against those. So you can see that the triangle here uh, is is the first score that this team gave themselves. It's the, it's the baseline score, and. Even if it, you're scoring very highly on it, all the all the areas, we can see that you know project justification management here and scope management are things that really this team or this individual or this organisation really need to do some effort on. Now, once you know that you need to grow in a key area of the project, you can do something about it. So rather than spending your capacity building budget at the end of the project as you're trying to shift money off the project. Actually spending it at the beginning of the project and, and bringing your team up um, to the right performance level is absolutely the right thing. And I think both John and I would agree that said if you did this for every project where you perhaps work with a local partner, then slowly but surely that local 
partner's skill set is being improved again and again and again, which is only helping you reach your strategic focus. It's a great activity to reflect on your own, perhaps pull out your job description. You can fill in the key areas of the job description and call, score yourself. You could do it with your, your project team before the project team begins. They could pick the, the, the labels and we could score ourselves generally. Who's good at resource management? Well, John's really good at that. Um, I'm okay at it, but together we can score quite high because John's really good at it. Um, we both have, you know, really strong skills in, in time management, but we could both do with a little bit of impact on risk management. Who in the organization is good at risk management? How can we upskill? And then once you know what you need to upskill on, uh, the process of, of sort of building your own capacity, whether that's reading books or doing uh, asynchronous sort of e-learning courses or coming on webinars, whatever that is, talking to people, the solution is relatively simple. It's about the identification of weaknesses at the beginning and throughout the life cycle of the project. Over to you, John. I think that covers most of it. Yeah, thank you so much, Ross. And yeah, I, I think that's great. And one of the reasons it's so important to do this now is you, know, you, you, you know that if you have a skills problem, your project is going to suffer. Very, very simple. And then so often you, you realize in the project, and then there's no budget for it. Or well, there's no time to do the, that training, which means your project is now late. But if you didn't have the right skills at the start of the project, then you can pretty much guarantee that your project is going to suffer and will be late before you start. So trying to map some of this out um, before you do the planning is really, really helpful. And there's a fantastic question from Lotta um, in the chat, which I've just seen. Uh, how to identify the skills, and, and I actually think this is a really important question. Um, and with, you know, it's also an important part of risk management because, especially if the project is a new area, you may not even know what all of the the risks are. But actually, a lack of skill in one area is also a risk. So. So the first thing, oh, thank you, Ross, you've, you've just, uh, just done some virtual cake distribution, good. I think it's, I, I would go back on something that Ross said, which is about what are the success factors for the project? I mean, as I said in the chat, you can use this for a one person or a department, whatever you like. Um, but I mean, we're focusing it on project management. So you take your project and what are the skills that the project will need? So if you've got a livelihood, um, project around agriculture and there's a lobbying component. You know, in that project, yes, you might need some of the agricultural skills, the training skills. You might also need some management skills, some reporting skills, communication skills. You might need some research skills on, say, government, um, uh, government food import policy. You might need so to, you might realize that your advocacy skills are a little bit weak. Or maybe that the partner's advocacy skills are weak. So by understanding what, what skills are needed for the project to be successful and having a, I think, another thing that Ross said that's really helpful is you're trying to get people to talk about this. Project managed, projects are not managed by bits of paper. They're managed by people. It's the right people having the right conversation at the right time. So, uh, I mean, I, I think that it's um, really trying to be as specific as possible about the skills that the project needs to be a success. Um, I mean, Ross, is there anything that you would add to that? Over. No, John, I'm just quickly catching up with Lotta's follow-up question. We advise that applying our organizations do an LFA workshop here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that that's 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 a great time to identify the skills. I think once you've got your 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 log frame together um and you know exactly what your project is. Sometimes when we're doing the problem tree we're still pinning down the specifics of that project loss and, and we want to draw that that project out of that problem tree. So really 
you know, digging into that and pulling out those key success factor skills are going to be really important. And it's not necessarily about looking at those really general skills, like I said, but, you know, if you know you're great at m and &E, you really don't need to put m and &E on here. It's about looking at the critical things that the project is really going to make or break, like your knowledge of local stakeholders or something like that could go in there. I agree, Ross, and, and it's a bit like I've been, and you need to be iterative, because you do the best you can as early as you can, but as you, you learn more as you go through the project, you know, you, you may then need to, to revisit as well. Um, and again, I just want to, you know, the other point is that people have got to be honest and realistic. There's no point, oh yes, we're really good at financial management, if you're not, because it's just going to come and bite you later. So, that's just a little bit about the project setup phase. Um, now, that takes us into the next phase, which is planning, very much the heart of PMD Pro. So, we've got a series of tools to help us. Work breakdown structures are designed to give us a comprehensive and detailed understanding of all the work. What are we trying to do here? Um, when you know what all of the work is, you can then put it into a sequence, and that's what the network diagram and critical path are trying to do. So, what goes first, what goes second, uh, what can be done in parallel, and then the critical path analysis is saying, well, how long is it going to take? And to help us work out how long it's going to take, you've got different estimating techniques. Top down, bottom up, three point estimating, um, and, and it's very often a combination of them. And what's interesting is when you've done all of that, then a Gantt chart is a great tool to reflect when you're going, what are the activities, the tasks, when are they going to start, when are they going to finish. One area where I see NGOs go very wrong is that Gantt charts are often done very, very quickly. Absolutely, Ross, it's the output, it's not the start. And if you do a Gantt chart, you take the activities out of the log frame, copy and paste them, put it into a, a say, activity plan, and say, now, this is our uh, uh, implementation plan for the proposal. Yes, it's done, but it won't be right and it won't be accurate. Um, so, these, the work breakdown structure, network diagram, critical path, estimating, these are the process tools to allow us to have a realistic Gantt chart. And then the RACID tool shows us who is responsible, who will be accountable, who do we need to consult with and who do we need to inform for each one of the tasks. And again, where do we get our tasks from? We get them from the Gantt chart. Where do we get those tasks from? We get them from the network diagram and the work breakdown structure. So you can see how the different tools um, work, work together there. Now, we are running a little bit short of time, so I think we need to jump to the next phase and which is implementation, thank you, Ross. And in implementation, you know, something always goes wrong. Because it does. And there's nothing to do with NGOs. It's just project management is difficult. Um, I've never seen a project without changes. So, to help us with this, issue logs is a really simple tool to show Every issue, every problem, everything that wasn't planned, what are you doing about it, tracking it, managing it, who's doing what. And at the end of the project, that's a fantastic aid to your final learning. Um, and later, absolutely, of course we will. We will definitely share the recording. Sometimes I see NGOs. And, you know, you have a plan, and it's for like five years, and it's in incredible detail. And I look at this, and I say, you know, well, I know what I'm doing tomorrow, and I have a good idea about what I'm doing next week. What am I going to be doing on Thursday in two months' time? I don't know. I've got no idea. So, you know, I, I sometimes see NGO plans that are really unrealistic, and rolling wave planning is the idea that you plan, you know, in as much detail as you can for the life of the project, but you have a much more detailed plan for maybe the first month or three months or six months or whatever is appropriate. At the end of that period, you can have a decision gate, stop, look at the project, 
How are we doing? Do we need to make any changes? And then develop another detailed plan for the next period. So you're doing your detailed plans for short periods of time. Sooner or later, there will be a delay because there always is. You know, something goes wrong. So there are two techniques for dealing with it, fast tracking and crashing. Um, crashing is adding more resource if you've got it. But fast tracking is you're taking an activity from later in the project and you're doing it earlier. Now, there's a risk. There is no free lunch in project management, unfortunately. So maybe, yeah, you, you do something earlier, but maybe there is a quality problem. So, you know, that risk has to be managed. And I think this is a really interesting idea as well about tolerances, which is why, what do you want, what do you want the project manager to be able to do without checking with anybody else? You know, because, you know, is it okay for me, imagine I'm your project manager, I work for you. Is it okay for me to start the project on Tuesday, not Monday? Is that okay? Maybe. Maybe not. What about a week? Meh, not sure. A month? No. Well, how do I know? Maybe it is okay. So the idea of tolerance is being clear as early as possible about what the project manager can do or not do. And how are those bigger decisions going to be taken? Um, because there will be, sooner or later, in every project, there is a decision that must be taken, and it is outside the tolerances of the project manager. Okay? How is it going to be done? And trust me, if you work out how it's going to be taken, at that time it will be much more difficult and much more painful. If you've discussed this earlier, then it is much easier because everybody understands what the process is going to be. Now, when we've implemented, well, whilst we are implementing, we also need to monitor, uh, we need to evaluate, and we need to control the project. And here, change control that we were just talking about. You're going to have to do it sooner or later a big change will need to be made. Okay, what's the process going to be? We also know that there are different sorts of evaluation. So, you know, PMD Pro just tries to structure it. I think it is a bit simplistic. Um, you're starting to see the humanitarian sector doing more and more real-time evaluations, which I think are, are really good. Um, but there are the mid-term evaluations, final evaluations, and these which are very interesting, the ex post, the ones which are done maybe six months after the end of the project. If you go back, I don't know, six months, a year later, and you still see impact, then it's probably good. You know, at the end of the project, everything looks wonderful, but does it last? Well, if you don't go back, you won't know. Um, and then, and value management in, I think, an interesting way. Uh, you know, you see so many conversations where the finance starts saying, you're overspent, you're a criminal, this is terrible. And the program starts saying, it's very complex, you don't understand, it's about the community. Actually, both are right. And earned value management is a technique for simply bringing together the information about budget. Are you under budget, on budget, or over budget? with the information about the schedule. It's a it's tool to get the finance staff and the program staff to talk to each other. And after doing this with one of one of big organization in Zambia, they said that one of the uh, uh, um, the core benefits that they hadn't anticipated was for the first time the program staff and the finance staff were having productive conversations. And there are differences between monitoring and evaluation. You know at a high level, monitoring is very much looking at the bottom part of your logical framework. What are the inputs? What are the outputs? Are they being achieved? What needs to be changed? What's going well? What isn't? Um, and evaluation is looking at the top part of the log frame. You know, are the assumptions correct? Are the outputs achieving the outcomes? Are the outcomes making a contribution? 
towards the goal. So again, this is this different elements of this happen all through the life of the project. And then at the end of the project, we get to the transition phase. Um, and thank you, Ross. And transition, as I said at the beginning, a bit more complex than in maybe the private sector. There are different um, transition types. Maybe we finish the project, but we might extend it. We might make it bigger. We might have to redesign it. It can be quite a complex process. So in PMD Pro, we talk about contractual closure, financial, and administrative. I'm sure many of you, and I certainly, have experienced everything is closed down, and the supplier turns up with an invoice that needs to be paid. So we've got to make sure that we've really taken care of all of this. And the transition planning matrix is a tool to help us. And this is just a plea, really, that as we end a project, let's not forget the end of project learning. I know it's difficult because people are leaving, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but I just think it's a little bit sad that so much good learning then isn't documented. It gets forgotten, and then we just make the same mistake again, um, which is, uh, I, I think, um, well, I, I think it's unprofessional actually, uh, and I think it fails our beneficiaries. So I think learning from the past is absolutely um, fundamental. So at this point, I want to focus quickly on something that's a little bit different. Because it's easy to talk about tools. You know, and you can use a tool well or you can use it badly. I can use a hammer to bang a nail into some wood, or I can hit the nail with my head. Using the hammer will be more effective. So we've got something called principles, which is how you use the tools. And in PMD Pro, you say you want, we want to be comprehensive, we want to be participatory, balanced, integrated, and iterative. And sometimes people say, what is a PMD Pro project? Is it a project which uses all of the tools? No, absolutely not. Maybe you've already got some good tools. Fantastic. Maybe you don't need all of the tools. Okay, good. But I do think that a PMD for a good project will be iterative, integrated, balanced, comprehensive, and participatory. I can't see a project being well managed that does not correspond um, with these principles. Okay, so at this point, what difference does it make? Um, and, well, here you can see on the screen what, what some people are saying. Um, but, I mean, for me, I, I, I mean, and there's a story. Ross, if you could put a link to the case studies for people, I think that, that would be really helpful. But there's an amazing case study from Zimbabwe where we trained World Vision uh, uh, staff and trainers. The World Vision trainers trained their local partners, and they used the tools to build a classroom or something like that. But the community said, you know, we like these tools. And they just, with no help from World Vision at all, they used the tools to build, I think, a teacher's block or some, a second part of the project. For me, that makes a difference. That's real sustainability. And you know, to be honest, that's why we did all of this. We want to find ways to, to get as much information about project management to as many people as possible. And so this is where you continue. You, as, 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 as the guide is free. Um, Ross has put links on the screen. So there's a self-study site. You can learn for free there, which is great. There are tools there. There's a practice exam. You know, you, know, you, you, you can, there's a whole load of stuff that you can do which is free. Uh, and then you can also, you know, if, if you want to do more and get more training, that's, that's also possible. But, I mean, it's also about spreading the word. Uh, um, you know, and if you see something that's useful, just feel free to share it. Um, if you've got colleagues who you think would benefit from coming to a webinar, please tell them. We're going to be having a, a webinar a, a month um, going forward. So, you, you know, we will have one on risk management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, you know, we'd be really happy to see you again, and we'd be very happy to, to help in, 
in any way. So I, I think at this point, it's just a chance to see if there are any questions from anybody. Feel free, put them in the chat. Uh, we're really, really uh, happy to help. Um, and we are at the hour, so I'm happy to help with any questions. But I, I just wanted to quickly hand over to you, Ross, to see if you had any uh, final thoughts, um, or comments, observations, questions uh, as well. So over to you, Ross. Um, thanks, John. I, I really liked uh, some of the questions people were asking, and, and I think there's, there is some definite interest to get into some more specifics. And I guess the problem with these one-hour webinars, John, is that you know it's kind of hard to pack in what is effectively five days' worth of training. And there is a self-study site out there, um, as well as the training courses that we provide. I stuck loads of links in the chat, um, so you can have a look. You can follow Lingos at Twitter and catch up with us. So. You know, thanks for coming. If there is something specific that you would like John and I to discuss in a webinar that you think would be really useful, uh, just send us an email. I just dropped the email address for, for John and myself in, in the chat there. Drop us an email. And if we can help you in any way with making a webinar, of course we will do. And it's great to start the conversation. So thanks all for coming. I hope you've had a fantastic time. And I, I hope to see you next month. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ross. And uh, and again, great to see everybody. And do please share, you know, spread the word. We're happy to help. We will send around. Um, we will send around the links, and we are going to try to put it. We will. Um, uh, oh, later, you can actually um, on the website. You've got a whole series of case studies from a number of different uh, organisations. Um, that's on the PMD Pro Forward site. And what, what, what I would suggest, Leonard, is, is have a look at those. And um, I would be very happy to put you in touch with, with anybody, really. Uh, um, you know, whether it, it's an individual level or an organizational. And what we tried to do was to get some different sorts of case studies. So uh, some of them are like whole organizations. Some of them are, are maybe more regional. Uh, uh, some of them are. Um, a local organization, so we just try to get a, just some different sorts of examples. So just let me know, Leila. I'm really, really happy to, to, to help. Leila, yeah, sure. Go, go for it. Share anything that you want. I mean, look, we, we put this together for the sector, all right? That's why the, um, you know, the guide is free. It's in as many languages as possible. Uh, if people want to do exams, they don't have to. You know, there is cheapest. You know, for local partner organisations, exams only cost twenty dollars. You know, so uh, uh, um, it, it, it's it's very much about tr trying to find ways to, to help the sector, which is about spreading the word. So, uh, um, so please feel free to share anything. And you know, I, and Irene, no worries. I'm very happy. It's great to 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 share it. Happy to just let let us know if there are any questions. And Hany, I'm glad that you like the different tools. We didn't cover all of them today because there's no time. But you can download the guide you can, and you can see everything everything there. Okay. Great. Well, look, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, we're going to be we'll stop the recording now.